Well, hello, I'm Graham, and uh, if you don't know me from sight, Graham Care is my name, and uh, you might wonder why I'm dressed up like this. <laughs> Normally I have a nice dark charcoal grey suit and a sober tie, and I thought this is not the time for dark suits and sober ties, so I hope you'll understand that uh, I'm using this as a kind of colour bar <laughs> for what you're getting at the moment. I am delighted to be here because I came here to Warm Beach in order to find out what it meant to be loved by God, literally, personally, and then taking that love to immediately, because it's so clearly evident when we understand how much we're loved, that we love right back. So I get to to find out what it is to love God with all my heart and all my soul and all my mind. And this isn't easy. I understand that, especially nowadays, because there's so much going on that is so distracting. Um, <coughs> it gets my attention, and um, my attention moves away from what I'd love most of all to be able to do. But the thing that I found most wonderful of all <laughs> is I've got to love you. You're members of my family, and I always refer to you as family in chapel, because you really are my family now. And so whatever I'm doing about loving is loving you with the same love that I've received from the Father through Jesus Christ. And, and now I can just let it pour out all over the place. So you'll know, forgive me if I just uh, am... Uh, right off the top of my head sharing things with you so that I'm not reading from some idiot board or anything else. I have notes which have been given to me and I'm very committed to Gary and to the rest of the team that look after us so brilliantly. So right now um, this is like service for the chapel and that was like an invocation if you will. And uh, I would love to be able to pray with you at the moment for this service that we're about to have. Okay, let's bow our heads. Oh, Father, you turn everything together for good for those of us who love you and are called according to your purposes. And according to your purposes, you said, I have a new commandment for you. This is my commandment, that you would love one another just as I loved you. So, Lord, we've read your story. We understand what you said and what you did, and we're learning all the time the depths of what that means to us today. And so we fix our eyes upon you during this service today, and we ask that you would lead us in your spirit. You said you would send us the Holy Spirit to comfort us, but we need to be comforted, and we receive that comfort now during this service. We ask that you would be with us, and that you would also move globally to comfort through your Holy Spirit all of our brethren, the 2.2 billion people on the planet today who have confessed you one way or another as their Savior and Lord. We don't know how many that really is, but we do know that you know, and therefore that you will answer our prayer for them, our brethren at this time. I pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. And so here we are, it's announcement time, and uh, I don't know whether you read the last edition of Link, but wasn't that fun? We saw all the things we could have done, and then each one was cancelled. <laughs> I like that idea. It would have been so easy to have just put all of the events are cancelled, just but they put everything in its place and then the little word cancelled in there, so that made me understand. It also means that to a degree we're being a little limited. And another one of those things which is a little limiting and a little bit concerning for some of us, and that is that the tiny score, store, upon which we rest so much of our understanding about how to go and get a bag of chips or a, a candy bar or whatever, at, at a moment's notice, just as, we, just as the mood takes us, we're down and we have such wonderful fellowship at that tiny shop. It's 
closed. Yes, it is for the time being. We're taking every possible way we can of limiting the possibility of handing something off our hands to another person that we love. And I know that's irritating for some, but surely our love for each other can overwhelm that limitation. Same thing about taking the bus out to various shopping places. And so therefore, a very real question might emerge in your mind, which is, how am I going to get the stuff that I need to have to be able to eat? And you know your best friend around here that you've ever had is Sheila, Sheila Bartlett, and she's certainly my best friend. So the big deal here is if you find that you need to have things and don't know how to get them, Sheila is the one to go to get that advice. If there's a long line at her door, you all know what that's about. Maybe we could have Kit Kat broken off into pieces and hand people a piece of Kit Kat on the line. But then you, you have to be six feet apart from the next person in front of you. So that's, that's going to last out to the freeway. <laughs> All right, my dear ones. Um, those are the immediate announcements that will affect us from day to day. Other things will come to line, and, and I'm really hopeful that I might be able to be here to sort of cheer us along um, as these things come and, and emerge in, in our lives. Isaac Owen is going to give us a glimpse of the kingdom. Through his eyes and through his heart, which has been set apart, for a few years now, as he's actually studying to be a minister. And he is ministering at the present moment in Mount Glen, where my mum was, um, was a member for a little while. She was also assisted living here at one stage, too. So Isaac Owen grew up in a Christian home, but he didn't have this personal relationship with Jesus until he was 12. And that was at one of those Friday night youth discipleship moments. Gosh, I'll be grateful for those times. So he played basketball and he was a student leader on his campus um, and he served in the United States Air Force for um, about the same amount of time that I served in the um, New Royal New Zealand Air Force. So we're a couple of flying guys. You know. I, I only flew a desk with reckless abandon, by the way. So he was married in August the 3rd um, uh, of 2012. His wife's name is Siri, S-I-R-I, -I, and he has to be careful at home before he calls her name out, and then the computer goes and does something like turn the lights out. <laughs> no, it's a little bit different. So he's enrolled in ministry preparation at Western University, um, Sir, Western Seminary. So here he is. Let's greet him and open our eyes and ears to hear what he has to say. Thanks for coming out. God bless. Well, good morning, Warren Beach. Uh, my name is Isaac, and I am a seminary student at Western Seminary. Um, I, I have a great love for God's Word and for God's people, and I'm thrilled to be with you this morning delivering um, from God's Word. Uh, and real quick, before we dive in, I wanted to, to give a little more introduction to myself. Um, I brought a picture with me of my family. This is, uh, this is one of the most recent pictures we've, we've taken. So this is my wife, Siri, who I think a lot of you know. Um, she works here on your newsletter and in a number of different capacities. This is my youngest daughter, Aurora, and my oldest daughter, Zoe. They're two and five, respectively. And this is my mother and father-in-law. And so uh, it's great to be with you this morning. And uh, I'm really thankful to have this opportunity. I was just um, sharing with a brother of mine how amazing it is that we live in a time when despite the turmoil and the uncertainty and not knowing whether or not we were going to be able to deliver a message this Sunday here at Warm Beach, uh, we can because of the technology we have and ultimately because God is not going to be shut out from his people and from his world. He is speaking always and I believe he has a good word for us th 
this morning. And so before we dive in, let's open with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father God, you are good in any and every circumstance, in every season. We know that you are good, that you are trustworthy, and that you are worthy of our praise and of our attention. We ask now as we open up your word that you would open yourself up to us and that you would open us up to yourself and that you would speak to us the words that are needful to us, the words of life. We lift these things up in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, this morning we're going to spend some time uh, talking about a topic that's been relevant since the very beginning, and uh, we're going to call it divine contentment, and we're going to call it peace, and specifically inner peace. And so we're going to turn to the Psalms this morning, and specifically Psalm 131. So let me read this, and we'll unpack it together. A Song of Ascents of David. My heart is not proud, Lord. My eyes are not haughty. I do not concern myself with great matters or things too wonderful for me, but I have calmed and quieted myself. I am like a weaned child with its mother. Like a weaned child, I am content. Israel, put your hope in the Lord, both now and forevermore. Now, this little song towards the end of the Psalter uh, is often classified as a psalm of confidence. It's a psalm about where we put our hope and what the effects of where we put our hope are. And one of the most striking things about this particular song to me is who it's written by, who a lot of the psalms are written by actually, and that's King David. Uh, if you know anything about the life of King David, you might be surprised to find him writing about having a, a surplus of inner peace or calmness in his soul. Um, because we read about his life in Scripture, and it's really anything but quiet and calm and content, right? Uh, as a young boy, we read about him shepherding his father's flock and being accosted by bears and lions. He talks about having to defend the sheep from bears and lions. And then, as a teenager, we read about him uh, battling against really what was probably the greatest single warrior that Israel had ever seen in Goliath. Um, and shortly after that, he ascended to a position of prominence in the kingdom of Israel and won many battles, which leadership in itself is stressful enough for any of you that have ever been in leadership, but for David, uh, he also had to face the vicious jealousy of King Saul, who on multiple times tried to assassinate him and ended up forcing him to flee into the wilderness. For almost a decade he spent in the wilderness uh, fleeing attempts on his life. Uh, and then his later life is characterized by utter upheaval and tumult, um, family chaos, professional chaos, uh, his own son tried to take the throne from him, um, and his life is anything but peaceful. And yet, he writes these words, uh, I'm calmed and quieted, my soul is content within me. So, when someone who's lived a life like that talks about calmness and inner peace, it should cause us to maybe do a double take and consider well, what's his secret? What does he know that we need to know? Because all of us long for that inner peace. Um, I imagine maybe you're here this morning and you hear the noise from, from all these voices around you in the world and there's anything but peace. There's anything but contentment. And you long, you say, Lord, I long for peace. And so we're going we're gonna to take a little dive into the life of, of this man, David, into the life of some other heroes of faith who um, had figured out 
this contentment thing in the midst of chaos and hopefully we'll be able to glean some really valuable insights and at the end of this you'll be able to, to have that peace that we're talking about. Peace in the midst of circumstances and trials. And so with that said, let's Let's take a closer look. Verse 1, My heart is not proud. Lord, my eyes are not haughty. I do not concern myself with great matters or things too wonderful for me. So right there in verse 1, we, we see uh, a part of the method uh, that, that David had to bring him. This, this tremendous peace. This supernatural peace. And, and the first thing we see is that he has a surrendered self-will. You see, pride and self-centeredness are the natural enemy to contentment and peace. We get so self-absorbed sometimes. You know, we're, we're afraid of that our needs won't be met, ultimately. Um, and when we have pride start to believe that we can control things that really aren't within our control at all, um, we get restless and worried and anxious. And so I want you to consider for a moment the opposite of this passage. My heart is self-absorbed. My eyes look down on other people. And I am constantly trying to control things outside of my ability and understanding. <laughs> Think about that for a moment. Which way do we more often live? Is it the way that David described in verse 1? Or is it the opposite of that which I just read to you? Um, and if I'm being honest with myself, it's probably the latter more often than not. And so w when we live that self-absorbed life, when we live afraid that our needs won't be met, when we live a life that looks down on other people, it makes perfect sense that our hearts would be chaotic within us and that we really wouldn't have any type of uh, inner peace at all. And yet we're called to live a better way. We want peace but all too often, we live in complete opposition to the way that Scripture tells us to acquire it. In Matthew chapter 14, Jesus told his disciples this, If anyone wants to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. You know, it oftentimes doesn't make sense, at least not to our natural person, for us to surrender the self-will in the way that I and the psalmists are describing to you. It often doesn't make sense for us to not be anxious or afraid. Um, it doesn't make sense to take up a cross and follow Christ the way that he's calling those who followed him to do. Crosses generally aren't good business for those who want peace. <laughs> and yet that's what he called us to do. And he makes a promise there and says that anyone who does this, anyone who loses his life, who dies to himself, who rids himself of his pride, the way that David describes doing, will find his life. He will find that peace. And so we see that peace is symptomatic of a life wholly surrendered to God's will. And I chose that word, symptomatic, on purpose, because uh, that's the type of uh, symptoms that we want in our life, right? Inner peace and contentment are what we long for. Consider this other example of our brother Paul, whose life, if you're familiar, like David, often seems anything but peaceful. He says in Philippians 4, verse 11 through 13, For I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. 
I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all this through Him who gives me strength. So Paul wrote that from a prison cell. And his words, like David's before him, point to a peace that exists outside of circumstances. It exists outside of ourselves. There's a reason that when talking about peace, we're talking about peace this morning, I keep using that word, peace, peace, peace. It comes from something greater than us. And ultimately, as we're going to see, we have to decide where that peace comes from. Because there's a lot of voices out there that are trying to tell us where it comes from. And not all of them are telling the truth. But ridding ourselves of our pesky self-wills and proud hearts is easier said than done, right? Can the leopard change its spots, is the old adage. Peace and contentment are great in theory until they're asked to be practiced in the midst of conflict. We, kick, we quickly discover that to be not self-absorbed and not condemning does not come naturally. So how do we get there? Let's look at verse 2. But I have calmed and quieted myself. I am like a weaned child with its mother. Like a weaned child, I am content. This is such a great illustration of how we, we get this peace. And especially for those of us who have raised and weaned children, we, uh, we might understand what the psalmist is talking about a little better when he talks about the contentment of a child that, that is weaned. Or, in other words, a child that is no longer solely dependent on its mother's milk for sustenance. Picture this. The child that is constantly fussy, that is constantly worried and in a state of frustration because they don't understand or fully know where their next meal is going to come from. They don't fully trust that all their needs are going to be met. We who have had children know what this is like. Uh, their, their fussiness and their self-absorption and their pride, uh, their me-centered focus is nearly tyrannical in scope. Nearly tyrannical. <laughs> and so what is being described here is the, the opposite of that. It's uh, a child who is entirely sure that its needs will be met by its mother. It's not afraid. It's not worried about where its next meal is going to come from. Uh, but it trusts that, that there are powers at work outside of itself that will meet those needs, that love and care for him or her. And so we're called to do the same. And as I described, the child that's not weaned is utterly fussy. When we don't believe that God will meet our every need, we become fussy and discontented in the same way. Our hearts scream, why are things not going the way that I want them to go? Why are you not providing for me the way that I feel that I should be provided for? Our hearts scream, my will be done, instead of thy will be done. We take on a posture of self-focus instead of, instead of a posture of God-focus, of Christ-centeredness. And so ultimately the way that we overcome this self-absorption. How is this possible? It takes a lot of hard work from the parent, doesn't it? It takes years and years of hard work and energy from the part of the parent 
It takes prayers. Uh, and so in that, there's an illustration for how we ourselves can uh, receive this type of peace and contentment. Go to God and, and ask Him to do that hard work in your life of sanctification and redemption and regeneration. Ask Him to give you the type of peace that a weaned child has. And we believe, we trust that He faithfully will. In Philippians 4 verse 19, uh, in the same letter, a few verses after, we just read about Paul exhorting uh, the church to learn contentment in every situation and in every circumstance. He says, And my God will meet all your needs according to the riches of His glory in Christ Jesus. My God will meet all your needs according to His riches and glory in Christ Jesus. The weaned child trusts that its parent is able and willing and ready to meet its every need. And so we, likewise, ought to trust that our God, who has all the power and riches and glory and authority in all the universe, is able and willing and ready to meet our every need. And that we have nothing to be afraid of. We have nothing uh, that we ought to truly be anxious of. Paul says... In Romans 8, in uh, a famous passage, many of you probably know it, uh, that, that nothing in heaven, nothing on earth, no sickness, uh, no war, no famine, no plague, no, no death, not even death, will separate us from the love that is ours in Christ Jesus. Do you believe that? Because if you do, then let that wash over your heart and, and give you the peace that we're talking about this morning. Let it calm your restless spirit. And so finally, in verse 3, we, we come to uh, the crux, the fulcrum of the passage. Uh, the advice, the secret, if you will, on which um, the whole thing hinges. Ultimately, where... How is he able to have this peace? How is he able to have this contentment? Um, and it's right there in verse 3. Israel, put your hope in the Lord both now and forevermore. You know, there's a lot of voices like we've talked about that are vying for your hope in this world. They're vying for your trust. They're telling you that they have the answers. As I was studying this week to present this to you, um, I came across that there are at least 25 major media outlets in the U.S. alone. That's major. We're not talking about the, the hundreds, if not thousands, of um, minor news outlets that are um, vying for your trust. And just, so just these major outlets spend in excess of $200 billion annually in advertising and in noise making <laughs> to get your attention, to garner your trust. In a time where much is made of fake news and false advertising and broken hopes, we ask the question, where can I put my hope? Where can I put my trust? Who can save us from the chaos around us? That's a question that's been asked since the very beginning. And thankfully, we have an answer here in Psalm 131 and really throughout every portion God's word. This is, this is a question that he 
desperately wants to answer. We can put our trust, we can put our hope, our expectation in Him, and it will be secure. Listen to what David says in another one of his psalms. This is from Psalm 33, starting in verse 13. The Lord looks down from heaven and sees the whole human race. From His throne, He observes all who live on the earth. He made their hearts, so He understands everything they do. The best equipped army cannot save a king, nor is great strength enough to save a warrior. Don't count on the war horse to give you victory. For all its strength, it cannot save you. But the Lord watches over those who fear Him, those who rely on His unfailing love. He rescues them from death and keeps them alive in times of famine. We put our hope in the Lord. He is our help and our shield. In Him our hearts rejoice, for we trust in His holy name. Let your unfailing love surround us, Lord, for our hope is in you alone. When we put our trust in things that are passing away, in things that are temporary, in things that crumble, it's only natural that our, our hope and our peace will crumble along with them. But when we put our hope, as David describes, in the one who is eternal, unchanging, and who is in control of all things, it says he looks down from heaven and he sees everything. He sees the whole human race, our coming, our going. He sees our hearts. He made our hearts. He can give peace to our hearts. And He wants to give peace to our hearts. And so this morning, I want to leave you with this final word. If your hearts are restless within you, and if the cares and burdens of this world seem too great for you to bear, and they often do at many points of our lives, young or old, in any and every season, there are moments where we ask, How long, O oh Lord? How long do I have to bear this? And we're reminded time and time again that we're not alone and that He is able and can give us peace and rest. So listen to the words of Jesus when He called His disciples to the same kind of peace. He says, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. That's from Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 through 30. So, remember that. That's where our hope needs to be placed if we long for peace. Because although David lived on the other side of the cross and on the other side of the redemptive work through God's Son, Jesus Christ, we live on this side of that work. We get the whole picture from God through His Word. We see what He has done. And we know and believe that, that Jesus his Son is the ultimate revelation of His hope in this world. It is the ultimate revelation of peace. And He longs to give us peace. He longs to give us rest. Which is why He came 2,000 years ago as a helpless babe and lived the perfect life that we never could and died the death that we deserved so that we might have peace everlasting with Him. And so this morning, if you're looking for peace and you don't know Jesus, you don't know the peace that I'm describing, I invite you to ask Him into your life. Ask Him into your heart. Come to Him, and He will give you rest. 
Don't buy, don't buy the voices that are trying to tell you that there is no peace and there is no rest because there is. Go with God this week. May the Lord bless you and keep you and make his face to shine upon you. Thank you for having me, Warm Beach. And I hope to see you guys again in person soon.